Hi, and welcome to today's episode of Piano TV. So over the next couple of months, we're gonna start exploring the composer Claude Debussy. So I wanna start it off this series of videos by discussing some of his most awesome, most well-known music. And that's what today's video is all about. We're gonna be listening to five different pieces that he wrote. And that is just to kind of give you like a starting point of what his music sounds like and to get a little bit of an idea of his musical style. Now, Claude Debussy is a modern composer, but not like, not like recent modern. We're talking modern as, as in the turn of the 20th century modern. And his music is often compared to impressionism in art. And we actually did a whole video on impressionism and music and Debussy is heavily featured in that. So check it out if you haven't seen it because that'll give more insight to what we're talking about today. Debussy is also the guy who wrote the really famous piece that you've probably heard of before called Claire de Lune. So anyway, with that in mind, let's get started. Debussy's style was really groundbreaking for the time, around 1900, and featured innovations like bitonality, which is using two different chords or sounds from two different keys at the same time. So that'd be like doing a C major chord and an F major chord in unison, for a simple example. Um, he used the whole tone scale and the pentatonic scale a whole bunch, um, and we've talked about both of those on the channel, so I can link to those in the blog if you, you know, want to go deeper into that. And he also was pretty known for randomly modulating, which basically just means changing keys without any obvious setup or bridge the way people in the early romantic and classical eras uh, would have done. Some people categorize his music under the umbrella of impressionism and impressionism and art, if you're not familiar with it, it's stuff like really kind of blurry, more abstract feeling based pieces. Think of guys like Monet and you'll have a pretty good sense of what I'm talking about. Debussy himself wasn't a big fan of the Impressionist label, but I do find it useful to use in the context of his music. Debussy's musical influences are worth mentioning since they're super diverse. He employed some techniques all the way from medieval music, like parallel fourths, fifths, and octaves, um, and he had an appreciation for Baroque music, um, especially the arabesques by Bach, but he was also a really big fan of the French composer Couperin. For romantic composers, Debussy drew influence from Chopin and Liszt, both for their pianistic writing, but also for their ability to daringly innovate and push boundaries. He was also influenced by the late Romantic Russian school with their use of ancient Oriental modes and their tendency to stick to the man. And of course, he was also highly influenced by Wagner, as many late Romantic composers were. And then beyond Western music, he also drew inspiration from the East. He was particularly a fan of Javanese gamelan music and the shimmering sound it created. We can divide the music of Debussy into three different categories, his early period, middle, and late period. And I want to use his kind of like growth as a composer to give us a little bit of a course today for exploring his music. So we're gonna start with his early music, then we're gonna move into his middle music, then we're gonna move into his later music and talk about the pieces contained in his developmental eras. In the late Romantic era, so towards the end of the 1800s, music had become really, really like, like big, like big orchestras, big sounds, Think of, think of Wagner to give you a good understanding of music and the musical climate at the time. Debussy, however, wanted to go in a completely different direction. So his works kind of went in the opposite vein. They're more abstract, they're a little more subtle, and they're smaller. He composed some notable piano works in this period, including De Arabesque and the famous Suite Burga Mask in 1890. This is the piano suite that Claire de Lune is from, and I'm sure you have heard that one before. This is also the era that his famous symphonic poem, Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn, is from. So if you've ever taken a music appreciation class or have done any similar such music study, you've probably studied this one. His very famous De Arabesques, two arabesques, was composed in this early period when he was just starting to set himself apart from other composers at the time. They were written when Debussy was about 30 years old between the years 1888 and 18. 91 and these pieces are some of the very first examples we have in the musical literature of impressionism in music. There's a certain earthy natural elements in these arabesques. When talking about earlier arabesques from the Baroque era, Debussy said, 
That was the age of the wonderful arabesque, when music was subject to the laws of beauty inscribed in the movements of nature herself. So we're going to take a listen to just a little bit of the beginning of the first arabesque. After the introduction, you'll hear Debussy's use of the pentatonic scale, and you'll also hear some polyrhythm, which is two different rhythms that happen together at the same time. to the afternoon of a fawn is very ambient and dreamlike and it's essential in any type of musical education class or study. This is a 10 minute symphonic poem and it was composed in 1894. So just so you understand what a symphonic poem is, it's basically music without any words that tries to convey the mood or the story of like a novel or a poem or any other type of art form. This is what Debussy himself had to say about the composition. The music of this prelude is a very free illustration of Mallarmé's beautiful poem. By no means does it claim to be a synthesis of it. Rather, there's a succession of scenes through which pass the desires and dreams of the fawn in the heat of the afternoon. Then, tired of pursuing the timorous flights of nymphs and naiads, he succumbs to intoxicating sleep in which he can finally realize his dreams of possession in universal nature. Mallarmé was not originally too pleased that Debussy used his poem as a launching point for his musical symphonic poem. However, Debussy invited him to the premiere, and after seeing the premiere, Mallarmé was like, actually, okay, I'm cool with this. I really liked what you did with my concept. There is a lot to unpack in this recording, and that's one of the reasons why it's so often used in musical studies. But since we're only going to be listening to a little bit of the introduction, that's what I want to talk about right now, just before we listen to it. So in the introduction, you will hear a flute, and that flute is really kind of ambling and almost improvisational in nature. And this is the the musical instrument that represents the fawn. It's also interesting how different it sounds compared to other orchestral pieces of the time because it was written for a small scale orchestra, so it doesn't sound big. It sounds really, uh, really gentle. Anyway, take a listen to the whole thing, but let's listen to the first 30 seconds. During Debussy's middle period, he composed a very anti-Wagnerian opera called Peleus A. Melisande, which was very successful and influenced the works of subsequent French composers like Maurice Ravel. Um, it was just anti-Wagnerian in the sense that it Wagner was all about like giant symphonies and bombast and lots of flair, whereas this was a very subdued um, opera. He also wrote a famous symphonic piece called La Mer in this era. But my favorite compositions of Debussy's from his middle period are the piano ones. Surprise, surprise. I love his A Stamps Prince collection written in 1903. It's basically three movements that um, evoke various sounds. They're very, they're very pictorial. And he also composed Children's Corner and Preludes during this time between 1908 and 1910. First, let's talk about the collection Prince. This collection has three movements and it runs about 12 minutes long in total. So what I'm gonna share with you today is a little bit of the third movement called Gardens in the Rain. This piece details a garden in the town of Orbeck during an intense rainstorm. Debussy uses lots of musical symbolism in the short movement, such as alternating fast notes, which depict raindrops, things like that. He also uses various scales in this piece, like minor scales, which you'll hear in the beginning, um, but he also uses chromatic and whole tone scales. So let's have a listen. <laughs> Thank you. 
So I want to share Debussy's 10th prelude from his first collection of preludes with you, and it's called The Submerged Cathedral. And mainly I want to show you this one because it's one of my favorites. I think it's a really cool piece, but it's actually like also a pretty common piece too. So it's just like some random miscellaneous one that I'm throwing in there. An interesting thing that Debussy did with his prelude books is that he didn't put the title, like the, the submerged cathedral in this case at the start of the music he put it at the very end because he didn't want to give you like a preconceived idea as to what the composition was about before you heard it so i just thought that was kind of neat this piece is based on a myth the myth is about a submerged cathedral off the coast of wise that rises from the sea on clear mornings like a ghost cathedral so in the myth you can supposedly hear church bells and other sound on these mornings so in the opening part of this piece, you'll hear the sound of open fifths, which Debussy uses to convey the sounds of distant church bells, basically a form of musical symbolism. He also uses a pentatonic scale in this introduction. Later on in Debussy's life, his music became more and more abstract and he became less concerned with prettifying his music. So he would use like more wide open dissonances and he would use more whole tone scales, stuff like that. It was during this time that he wrote the second set of preludes as along with his batch of really difficult piano etudes. He also wrote some sonatas for the violin and for the flute. We'll talk about the violin and piano sonata in just a moment here. Um, and these sonatas depicted a really marked change in direction. His music started becoming more direct and clearer sounding, less blurry. I want to take a look at Debussy's sonata for violin and piano from 1917. This was Debussy's very last major composition before his death. And the whole thing is really short for a sonata. It's only 13 minutes long. It also happened to be his final public performance because he died in 1918. What's really cool about this is that it combines the traditional concert style with some really neat gypsy violin playing. The sonata also shows a break in his more pictorial style of writing into something that just is more purely abstract. So it's not necessarily like like with the submerged cathedral, for example, it's giving us a really specific thing to envision. It's giving us a story, but this doesn't have that specific image behind it. So we're going to take a listen to the beautiful beginning of this sonata and you can hear the really different sound that WC style was starting to, to lean into, but unfortunately he didn't really get to explore that style in depth because of his impending death. Anyway, let's take a quick listen. all for today's video. I hope you enjoyed this tour through Debussy's music. Hopefully this gives you a launching point if you're not very familiar with Debussy and maybe we'll give you some new music to listen to or ideas for what to listen to next. You can come hang out on social media if you'd like. We exist on Facebook, Instagram, it's, it's kind of like my personal thing, and Twitter. And you can also come visit us on Patreon if you would like to do that. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next video. under the impression it's basically a uh...